Well, later tonight, we'll have a very special live performance from Australian music icon. He's got a new track and his name is Mr Paul Kelly. Please uh, look forward to him. Uh, and you can live stream this, as always, on iView and YouTube. And you can join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter and the Gram. Uh, the Quanda is the hashtag. Please play nicely. Our first question tonight comes from Tony Wolf. I was born and raised in Latrobe Valley and have worked in the power generation industry there for over 40 years. I sometimes joke that I work in a CO2 factory because we actually produce more tonnes of CO2 than we do megawatts of electricity. I'm passionate about this issue because I see our industry crumbling around us and I'm frustrated at the lack of policy and leadership being committed. I openly stick my hand up and acknowledge that we need to move away from the use of fossil fuels. But without a plan of action, who is going to pursue this? Sophia. Well, thank you for the question. Um, who is going to pursue this? It's a... I'm actually, I feel really strongly about this, the transition argument. I, I come from far north Queensland and I'm from a, a place where a, a lot of my friends also are working in resource-based industries. And I focus on trying to look at transitional jobs. So the, um, the work that I do is uh, transforming CO2 into building materials. And we actually, um, we're focusing on cements and plasterboards uh, primarily right now. And we're a critical um, technology pathway towards carbon neutrality and negative emissions. So we're actually taking the lead in, the, um, in global industries right now. And um, businesses and industry are approaching us without government prompting because it just makes business sense to be able to take your waste products, to be able to take your CO2 and process them into different materials. You can turn CO2 into fuels, into minerals, into chemicals, into lots of different products that we don't even know yet unless we um, apply an, a circular and innovation mindset. So we're doing it. We do have government support to get to where we are, but we need more government support. Um, I really think that um, industry can take the lead in this area, but if governments can um, give a little bit more support to R&D and helping companies get through the valley of death, we can create a really vibrant industry in Australia for sustainability jobs and for CO2 processing into different materials. Jennifer Westacott, can, should business do it themselves, regardless of whether government is providing the big plan of action? Well, business is already doing uh, lots of things in this space and we can talk about some of those examples. But to your very important question, I think we've all got a responsibility to kind of find a way through this. And that starts with where do we want to be? You know, and, and the science tells us that where we need to be is a net zero emissions by 2050. So let's start there and let's work our way. What are the milestones? How do we so hold ourselves accountable? What are the technologies? How do we create jobs in regions? What are the new jobs? How do we accelerate technology? How do we do this in a way that preserves affordability, keeps prices down? How do we do it in a way that keeps reliability up? Uh, how do we do it in a way that grows the economy? Uh, how do we do it in a way that brings the community with us? Because we have to, surely, after this summer, draw a line in the sand and find a way through as a country. That means that we come together, we bring the community together, we find a way through so that your future and the future of people in the industry that you're in is a lot more certain than it is at the moment. So, so what is the BCA saying on net zero by 2050? We're saying we have to get there. We have to do the net zero by 2050. And should the government commit to that, legislate for that? Well, I think that would be a start, Hamish. I mean, the how really matters, and the how matters to the question you but, but just asked. But just setting that timetable uh, and that objective. Uh, I reckon, Hamish, if we could get the two political parties to agree to that and legislate it, we would have made a massive advance in this country because we would know where we're going. And for business that does want to take action in this space, that would at least give us a kind of certainty about well, where are we heading. So this Zali Stegall bill today that you're familiar with, yep. that's basically what she is yeah, yeah. giving the parliament the option to endorse. Yeah. Are you saying to the two major political parties, the business community says tonight, do it? Well, well let's be clear for everybody what she's proposed, but it's very sensible what she's proposed, that we set the net zero 
uh, emissions by 2050, that we set uh, five yearly carbon budgets, as she calls them, where we try and say, well, what can we do over a five year period? And obviously that has to be about what technologies are in place, how does the economy respond, how do we make that transition, how do we hold ourselves accountable? To me, that's a really important starting point that she's put forward. And it's a very, to me, it's kind of, uh, you know, pretty basic that we start there. But make no mistake, and she acknowledges this, that the how really matters. The how matters to your question. We've got to get the how right because we've got to create those new jobs. We've got to manage that transition. We've got to make sure we bring the community with us. We create those jobs in those regions. But to be honest, Hamish, what she's put forward today, I think, is a really important start. All right, I want to find out a bit more about Tony because he's got a pretty fascinating story. Uh, do you mind just standing up for a second, Tony, so you can share some of it? I know you describe yourself as a bit of a Homer Simpson. Why? <laughs> when, I, when people ask me what I do um, for a job, I'd say I work in a coal-fired power station. I'm a bit of a dinosaur. My role is Homer Simpson because that actually um, reinforces their view of our industry and, and, and our um, region. That's, that's, that's what we feel that we're um, put in the mould of. But tell me what you've done to your home and what kind of car you drive now. So I drive an electric vehicle. I've just renovated a house to eight-star energy rating. Um, I'm on the board of Gippsland Climate Change Network. Um, I'm doing my little bit, but until we get the high level stuff sorted, it, it seems to be quite pointless. So working in a coal fired power station, do you look at what they're discussing and, and see a way in which Australia can do this and make this change without the big framework from government, the legislative pathway all the rest of it. We, 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 need, we need decisions. We need policy framework. We need, we need, we need an idea of, of where we're going. The workforce that I'm with is highly innovative and, and, and up, for, up for the challenge. We, we will adapt to whatever is um, whatever's put in front of us. And, and we've proven that in the past. And, and, and I, I actually believe that, that the, the workforce once they have that direction, we'll, we'll take that challenge on wholeheartedly. All right. I want to put this to you, Martine Wilder, because it's something you think about deeply. Can we do this without the big settings from federal government? Yeah, so I think, um, firstly, Tony, I just want to say, I mean, every job is important and your job, like any other job in Australia, is important and we need to do the best to look after those jobs. Also, transition, which you're talking about, is not easy and it's caused a lot of anxiety in the community. And I think that one, one thing that's very important is to communicate what this transition is. And I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about what that is. And I think if we take the energy sector, which you, you know, are obviously a proponent in um, and work in, um, that sector has traditionally been a system that has operated on big power stations with big poles and wires to transmission the energy around the country to people who need it. Over the last 15 years, we've been putting a lot of different types of energy uh, renewable energy into that system, which has been ca causing, you know, it, it creates a bit more instability in the system. As a result of that, um, people have looked very carefully at how do you manage that, and that's um, through things like, like, like batteries and storage. The, there is a feasibility study going on for, for Snowy at the moment, Snowy Hydro, to create a big battery of the nation. And going forward, we really need to manage this transition very well. And I think one of the really important things from Latrobe, and I think the lessons that I've seen from some of the work that's gone on, is what's absolutely critical is that the business itself works with communities. Because we often talk a lot about government policy, mm. but the truth is often the businesses are dictating when those assets will close, how they will close without talking to workers and communities. Mm. So it's absolutely fundamental that the businesses themselves work with the communities and then work with government collectively to do that transition and to plan that trans transition properly. And I think, you know, when you look at what, what the... I think one of the challenges that we face is that there's a lot of rhetoric around about what's going on in the energy sector. But in truth, we have an incredibly dynamic energy system in this country. I mean, it's going through a major transition. Can, um, can, it, can it do what's needed, though? Absolutely. Without the federal government laying the pathway? Um, well, I think at the moment, we have federal government agencies that are laying that pathway. So AEMO is playing a key role. Um, but, but the Grattan Institute role, says there's too many agencies and it's too confused to actually deliver. Um, I mean, that's the Grattan's view. I mean, in my view, if you look at what's going on at the moment, there's a key focus on three things. So the first focus is on technology development. What are the new technologies, hydrogen that's coming out? The government's about to release a technology roadmap. 
Uh, secondly, the second key issue that we've got to focus on is transmission lines. So where are those big solar and renewable areas and how do we pull those into the system? And then thirdly, more storage so that we can actually store energy and have it available when we need it. And I think at the moment, um, AEMO has come out with the ISP recently and they say on a business as usual case, we will within 20 years get to 75% renewables and have cheaper power and, and lower emissions. So they're predicting on a business as usual case without significant policy change. With additional policy change, it will move much faster. Mm -hmm. But let's also be fair, the government in the past has set renewable targets and we've beat those targets. A 20% target, we're now 24% of the energy in the system is renewable. So there is no doubt that policy accelerates change and it's important for that change, but at the same time we need business to step up and lead more. We're going to come to meeting targets or beating them or not meeting them. Our next question tonight comes from David Burt. Hi, uh, I'm David Burt. I'm from the Latrobe Valley. I've been working with the Victorian power industry for 37 years. One of the issues that creates great anxiety in the Latrobe Valley community is the thought of uh, brown coal power station closures. Uh, my question really is around what can regions like mine be doing now or should they be doing to ensure a vibrant and successful future once brown coal generation ceases? Uh, Matt, you come from a long line of coal miners in your family. Yeah. You will have heard these sorts of stories before. Yeah, Tony and David both um, put, a, put a face on it and this is what's really amazing. I'm, I'm from a long line of coal miners. My grandfather was a, the last of, of uh, our family, the Evans coal miners out of, of Wales. And, and he left the industry because the coal mines had uh, closed. They ran out of coal, essentially, and it would be too dangerous to, to mine in, in South Wales and uh, uh, where he was. What, I, what really saddens me, and, and Tony asked the question, who's responsible? We're all responsible. Exactly. But what really saddens me is that, that you're saying that you have to pretend you're Homer Simpson. And, and, and somehow what your work is the devil's work. And somehow what you do is evil, right? No. Humans are just doing what we, what we knew how to do, creating power, you know, warming our homes, putting the lights on, all the things that we, we want to do. But, but what's happened is we need to transition away from that. What happened to my grandfather was the mines closed. He went to the US to work, got silicosis from the mines there and died of silicosis before I was born. Those little towns in South Wales were devastated for years, for generations. And what we don't want to do in Australia is forget you guys, the, the humanity. And the most important thing is that we look after you and give you a future. I don't have the answers to that. You know, I'm, not, I'm no expert in that. But what I think we have to recognise is that coal, the people who work in that industry aren't in heaven, inherently evil. The people, the people who work in, in renewables aren't inherently saints. They're not all working around with halos on their heads. They're just human beings. And we're just, w w when we talk about transition, it's, a, it's little micro steps to get to where we need to be, which is to, to get to zero emissions. Yeah, uh, but that's why, we need the, that's why we need the plan, to Tony's point. We, we need the plan so that we can do this in an orderly way, in a proper way that we can... And I think we need a real focus on regional Australia. Where, where are the new technologies? Why, why can't they be in regional communities? Why aren't we really actively promoting those regions across Australia? And then what do we do with our skill system, which is really out of date and not particularly working and our VET system has been allowed to become a second class citizen? You know, what are we doing to make sure that we retrain and reskill people and that we make sure that they've got access to those new jobs? But I, I think Matthew's point's really right. We can't keep demonising uh, you know, one sector against the other. This is all of our responsibility. We've all got to step up and we've got to find that plan and step our way through it and get it done and make sure that we do not leave communities behind. Uh, Osha, you've taken a lot of steps in your own life yeah. to start considering what your contribution is to all of this. Can you see when you sort of listen to these sorts of questions that for all of us across the economy, there's really different levels of sacrifice? I would never, I wouldn't call it sacrifice at all. Um, the, the benefits that I get in my life for the, the choices that I make around my impact on the world uh, are extraordinary. I, I too have an electric car and um, I've been driving electric cars since, since 2011 and they're an ex extraordinarily exciting, they're really fun to drive. Um, I have an electric bike as well, that I, a, a moped that I get around on, it, it's super fun. Um, but all these things, and you know, to your point, you might, you might feel hopeless, mate, but I, I want to promise you, we can only do what we can do, you and I. We can only make choices that affect our lives within our locus of control. 
I can't change the world. It was very tough for me to realise that I don't personally control global energy policy when I was going through, like, <laughs> enormous climate anxiety in 2014. Um, but I can, only, I can only change what I can change and I have to be happy with that because that is the locus of control that I, I can take. And, and then I can go to bed at night going, I've done everything in my power today to make sure that my life is a bit better and, and the world that I live in is a bit better and my kids are OK. And that's it. And go to bed at night. And and what we're talking about here, and we're, you know, we're talking about what role you know government has to play, particularly in in, in transition. Um, for me, our country, we're sitting we're sitting on the on the cusp of a new boom in yeah, in renewables. Exactly right? right? We have powered our nation on coal for hundreds of years, and the new party is renewables. Well, guess what? We've got all the lithium, cobalt, nickel, and copper mm. required for these yeah. batteries. They're right under our feet. Um, can you talk to the Minerals Council, please, and make them get a T-shirt that says? Don't dig here, dig there, because we've got it, all right? And the transition to these new uh, industries is, is there, but what it takes is overseas capital. It takes, well, not overseas exactly. capital, any capital, any capital, to feel safe to invest in this country. And safe to... I mean, ultimately, um, you know, I know I'm <laughs> going on a bit here to, you know... This is why I don't think this is a sacrifice at all. We're on the cusp of extraordinary abundance. I mean, look at our country. We could be the cat. We could be the Norway exactly. of clean energy. We really could. So we have a question on that. It's from Kylie Porter. Hi, my name's Kylie Porter. I'm the executive director of the Global Compact Network Australia, and my question's for Jennifer. But you've done a nice little segue into it. Jennifer, the BCA has stated that it's supportive of the Paris Agreement and Ross Garneau recently came out saying that Australia is the next superhero or superpower, sorry, of the renewable energy market. So what is the BCA actually doing to work with its members mm. to assist with that transition to net zero? And what's the actual plan that the BCA is putting forward, particularly for companies in the resources sector and the electricity market? Mm. Well, that is our policy and... Um... So what are we doing? We're doing a plan at the moment to, first of all, try and, I guess, take up Zali Stegall's challenge, which is how do you map this out? And where do we think the technology frontier is, to use that expression? How long will it take to get into certain technologies? And how do we make sure that we um, encourage governments to get the right policy settings to get those technologies accelerated? So the first thing that we'll be doing is sitting down with our members and saying, well, where are we on the technology front? And what do we think are the steps to get that to happen even faster? Um, where are we on the transition? So gas particularly is a very, very effective transition source of energy. It's 50% more efficient than coal. What are we doing uh, about our gas market? And then what are we doing about the regulatory arrangements that are going to drive those new technologies? And then how do we kind of make sure that we tell the story about what companies are doing? Because you do need a plan. You, 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 I agree with Martine, there's a, a, a level in which companies can do a lot but with a plan, they could do so much more. They could really step up on this. And we, our but job... Th this is a question, though, about yep. the BCA's role in pushing policy forward. Sure. And, and you have been supportive of the use of carryover credits from Kyoto, which is hugely controversial. Yeah. Uh, there's no other countries that have committed to trying to do that. Some have floated it. Australia's the only country in the world that is currently saying it wants to use carryover credits from Kyoto. Why support that? Well, look, I think, I think our starting position is this. If we can do this without it, we should. Can you? Well, that's, well, that's what I think we have to assess. Well, well, but I, think you, the I, really hope, I really hope you do, because trying to say that the Kyoto credits work is like saying to my... I, I, this is my second marriage that I'm in. It's like saying to my current wife, honey, I did heaps of dishes in my first marriage, so I don't need to do the dishes <laughs> no, no, in this one. And, 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 look, and, you know, I understand that. Two completely different things. I understand that, but I think our starting position is to say we should try and do this without the Kyoto Carry. I, I just am confused, though, because you're saying the business community is standing ready. We want net zero emissions by 2050. Sure. You know whether you can do this without Kyoto carryover credits. Well, I think... I think you, how do you know that, though, Hamish? Well, I if mean, you're saying you can meet net zero by 2050... Well, we, we surely... have to meet net zero by 2050, because that's what the science tells us. So then does so this actually we... help you get there, well, using we... the carryover credits? Well, I think we should... Our starting position should be to not use them, to try and do this without them. But, you know, where is all of the sector work but on each of the sectors... It's just you say you want policy living... certainty, but on this particular point, you want ambiguity. No, no, we, on this particular point, we would like the government's starting position to be, if you don't need them, don't use them. 
And let's see if we can do this without using the Kyoto Carry Forward, because I think that will drive a stronger change in the economy. But we have to make sure that we step out how we're going to do this and, and this whole question of what are the technologies that are, that are ready. And, you know, people talk about this, but they forget that we've got to do this for the whole economy. So when people say we're going to meet our 2030 target, that's, that's most often about electricity. It's not about the rest of the economy. So our starting position is if you don't need them, don't use them. And we should aim to not be using them. Sophia, What's... you've just been to Davos. Uh, you've effectively represented Australia. Uh, what was the feedback you heard about Australia wanting to use these carryover credits? Well, <laughs> the carryover credits um, in Davos, we didn't really talk about them all that much because, uh, as you said, none of the other countries in the world are um, planning to use them. There was a lot of um, a lot of eyes on Australia because of the bushfires, because of everything that we're going through. Uh, Matthias Cormann uh, gave a press conference at the World Economic Forum, and everybody was was looking at us about what we're doing for climate change, what we're doing for our policies. And uh, I would say that Australia, we definitely we're seen in a in a a light that we could be definitely doing more, we should be doing a lot more than what we are. And we've had a lot of political um, um, back and forth in that respect. But can I just ask a specific question to you, Martin, on this? Yep. If we use the carryover credits from Kyoto, that means that our actual emissions uh, by reductions by 2030 will only actually drop by 16% rather than the 26 to 28% that we've committed to. Um, how hard would it then be between 2050, 2030 and 50 to actually reach net zero emissions? Yeah, well, that, look, in my view, we shouldn't use the carryover, the Kyoto carryover credits. We shouldn't use them. And I don't believe that we need to use them. So I think if you look at, at a lot of the projections about where we're going, and I come back to your point, we have a phenomenal opportunity to develop the economy, and I believe we will get to the target faster than we expect. I think we will overshoot those targets. And, and again, as I said before, on a business-as-usual case, we're expected to get to, to I think it's 75% renewables in, in, in the energy sector by 2040. That's a massive reduction in emissions on its own. Then you take the other sectors like ag and transport and what's going on there. Every state government in Australia has committed to net zero by 2050. So there is a massive dr amount of traffic really going in that direction at the moment. But you still need the federal framework, don't you? You do need a federal framework, and, we're, and I think Zali Stegall's bill is important in that respect. And there's a lot that the, I mean, I'm pleased to say that Jennifer's in support of that. Um, Australian Industry Group came out today in support of that, so there's tremendous support behind that. But at the same time, I think my, my view is that what we're seeing in terms of investment in renewables, investment in... And New South Wales has just announced to, to take its entire 8,000 bus fleet into, into, into renewable energy and powered by batteries and hydrogen. That's a, that is a significant momentum that's building. South Australia are often at 100% renewables. There's incredible momentum in this country. And I think what often gets lost is we have all of this political rhetoric going on about, you know, governments and the opposition arguing about the position on climate. But when you look at what's really going on on the ground, I just want to give you one example from ARENA. So as some of you will know, ARENA is the federal government's um, agency that funds renewable energy. We have funded New South Wales University and they've developed a cell called the Park Solar Cell. It is the most efficient solar panel in the world and it's in almost mm -hmm. every single... So it's going to be rolled out in almost every single solar panel globally. So that is us in Australia have, for, have led the way on this for many years, almost 20 years. And those things people just don't know about. Mm. And I think something like that, ironically, it means that we're actually exporting renewable energy around the world and we're exporting emission reductions around the world. But we have some great stories to tell. And I think my experience travelling overseas a lot is that Australia is often criticised for its policy and its position and the rhetoric, but what's going on on the ground is often quite different. And I'm going to just give you one example. I mean, Canada is often held out to be be, you know, a strong advocate on climate, and they have been, but at the same time they're developing a massive oil, oil sands economy, which my understanding will 
consume about a third of the world's remaining carbon budget. So, you know, I think it's really important that we look at what is really going on. But this takes us back to the challenge of the transition, which I think was Tony's original question, mm. yep. which is we have a transition issue and we have to manage it. Well, our next question tonight comes from someone whose face you might recognise from a protest outside Kirribilli House last December. She's 13 years old and her name is Izzy Raj Seppins. At my second ever protest outside Kirribilli House, I was threatened with arrest by members of the riot police. Ever since then, my holidays have been a crash course in learning about the climate crisis, how political decisions are made, and how the media works. My question for the panel, do you think it's time we saw the school curriculum updated to give us kids more of the skills and knowledge we'll need for the world we're inheriting, with topics such as climate science, media literacy, and political engagement? Well, that's the question from Izzy. You might remember these images from over that period in December when she came face to face with some of the police at that protest uh, in Kirribilli. It made headlines and, of course, that red scarf uh, became pretty familiar as well. Uh, Osha, what do you think? Is it, is it worth training these young people in those sorts of skills? I, I'd say it'd be incredibly valuable, to be honest. And, and, you know, when you think about you know, what Martin's just said, that, you know, every state in, the, in, the, in our country has committed to net zero 2050 and the federal government is still like, eh, 26 by, you know, 2030. Um, just how out of touch they are with the fact that this young lady is going to be voting in four years from now. My uh, eldest, she's 16 years old, and uh, that's her mates at school, they talk about this a lot. They talk about, oh, did you know that, you know, that the, the, the dams at this level and the detail plan in Sydney are still running? Oh, and have you seen this thing from Snapchat? You know, they kind of transition <laughs> in and out of what world are we going, what kind of fury road am I going to have to fight for my life on? And this is interesting, this party looks fun. Um, I think it's an absolutely uh, important skill set to bring our young children. But there's a fine balance between going, here's where, you know, us as a nation can benefit incredibly from this transition towards renewables. Here's the jobs that will be existing in the future. Here's the employment opportunities that will exist in the next 15, 20 years. And here's also, you know, what you are literally going to have to be living with um, when it comes to climate mitigation and adaption and migration, let's be honest. But, of course, some politicians criticise young people for protesting, saying they should be in schools instead. Yes. Yeah, that's ridiculous. That's because they're completely... <laughs> yeah. that's, again, they're completely out yeah. of touch. I mean, 63% of Australians understand that we absolutely have to do something in a hurry. Majority of those are also coalition voters. And yet, it's not, it's not happening. So there's a disconnect that I, can't, I just can't understand. Yeah. My, my son wanted to go to, to the, to the climate, first climate strike uh, that, that was organised in Hobart uh, for students last year. And, and I, wasn't, I wasn't all that happy about it. And then Why? Why? Well, I just thought, you know, I don't, protest for protest's sake, you know, when, when there should be leadership from, from government. You know, I thought, well, fair, you know, I'm not sure he was going to get much out of it. Uh, but then, you know, when I heard our, our leaders say, I'll leave it to us, and I thought, well, when, I've, we've left it to you. We've left it to you. I studied, you know, I did, you know, I went to uni in 1988. Like, climate change was an issue at uni in 1988. You know, I'm... I'm not yet at the end of my life, but most of my life we've known about this issue. And, and we've done so little, we've done Sweet FA for so long that I said, yeah, go, go with all your, yeah, with your mates, go with the school and, and make the noise because, yeah, you're not, the grown-ups act, aren't acting like grown-ups. Maybe you guys can act like grown-ups and actually, you know, wake us up a little bit. That's exactly what, what, what G, she made. Her sign was, uh, we're, we're missing our lessons to teach you one. That was a sign that she made. <laughs> She's 16 years old, all right? So, Sophia, I know you wanted to get in here. And, and you've talked about something that you describe as the Greta effect. What is it? Yeah, so the, um, incorporating a youth voice into all, in, into all aspects of our society is terribly important. And climate change is massively important to us. Um, I was at the UN Youth Climate Change Summit with Greta. I was also at the World Economic Forum just uh, last month with Greta. Um, having climate literacy is of utmost importance to all of us, especially to youth. Greta, the Greta effect has empowered a lot of us, not only young people, but older people too, um, to be able to have frank and honest conversations at our dinner tables. And to be honest, Greta has been such an important part of getting CEOs and heads of state and leaders in our community to actually speak about climate change and sustainability with their children at their dinner table. And that has given people courage to actually 
admit what they feel and be able to investigate this issue in, um, in greater detail. All right. Well, we're talking about solutions and we're going to talk about individual solutions as well. Our next question comes from Alice Trumbull. Thanks, Hamish. Um, yes, as he said, uh, my question is about things that individuals can do. So changing your diet is one of the most impactful things a person can do um, on their own to reduce their environmental footprint. So how can we encourage Australians to eat less meat? Matthew. Yeah. Uh, good luck. Um, <laughs> oh, look, what's really interesting is, is um, you know, since I've been researching this topic, it, it, the Australians have... have um, I used to ask them, uh, I did a doco a few years ago, and we asked hundreds of members of the public, uh, would you change your diet for health reasons, for animal welfare reasons, or for the planet? And, and uh, you know, 90% you know, of people, or no, 80% of people would say, maybe I'd change my diet for health reasons, you know, 15% for um, animal welfare reasons, and 5% for the planet. And that has completely changed. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. who are interested, and I think because they feel powerless. I think they, a lot of people feel that, you know, this, this, this ang building anxiety, and it worries me with the, you know, the, with the kids that, 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 that we, if we give them too much information, that this build-up of climate anxiety. And, and one way for people to alleviate their anxiety is through their dietary choices. Um, one of the things we do know is that we eat too much meat, that meat has a, an environmental cost that is greater than uh, vegetables in, in some s systems at some times, and that eating less meat wouldn't be a bad thing for most Australians. We're, we're the largest meat eaters in the world every second year, I think, because America... And we swap places with America every second year. Um, uh, but how do, you, how, do you, how do you get people to change their diet? It, it, you know, we, when, if, we, if, we, if you've grown up in a family of meat eaters, you know, you're kind of used to eating meat. It's cultural. It's not just gastronomic. It's not just environmental. It's cultural. So but but people, people are making those decisions right now. People are changing their diet. They are changing their diet, but we still eat 110 kilos of, of meat per person per year, and, and it, which is about three times, four times yeah. the global average. So... Uh, and, and so, so we people are changing, but it's very it's very slow. I think and it's much faster than you think it is, man. Like the, the the biggest companies in the country, like Peters, don't accidentally put all the R and D into making three flavors of vegan drumsticks for fun. <laughs> they do it because it makes them money. Yeah, all right? yeah, I go yeah. to Coles, I see vegan mayonnaise on the shelf. They yeah. do it because it makes them money. All right, yeah. the, the the market is speaking. The market is absolutely speaking yeah. that they want to eat less meat. And when you look at that, you said eighty percent of people would change for health benefits. When you look at like I think we're twenty fifty, if people just follow only a vegetarian diet, it would save worldwide something like a hundred, no, a thousand billion dollars in healthcare, lost healthcare costs from diabetes and, and, and things like this. And yeah. reduce the, the emissions <laughs> by like 68%. It's enormous benefit, not only to your health, but also to the planet. I, yeah, I, wonder, so I, I, think what you I want to just go back to Alice, because <laughs> you've mentioned anxiety and people responding to that. Yeah. Alice, you describe yourself as someone that has experienced climate anxiety. A and what's that done to change your view not just on food, but also family? Um, probably a couple of years ago, as a result of um, studying what I have, I have studied environmental and climate science, um, I came to the conclusion that it was unsafe, unethical probably, and just a, a bad choice for me to make to bring children into the world. Um, I'd really like a family, but I'm way too scared to do it. And, and oh. what does that mean? For, I mean, that must be such an incredibly difficult thing, given that, as you say, you want to raise a family. Absolutely. Yeah. Alice, Alice um, like, as someone who has suffered incredible climate anxiety, I had episodes of psychosis that manifested as paranoid delusions. I was on antipsychotic, two different kinds of antipsychotics at one point. I was seeing things. It was, it was horrible. Um, I can say to you that you're not alone. And when, when you know what you know... It's a completely ordinary, normal reaction to have when you look at what is coming and, and, and you hear, you know, some of our politicians going, oh, it's all hot air. It's, it's horrifying to, to try and... Con and those personal choices you make are the things that I was saying before to Tony. They're the things that give you some agency in this. And I promise you, as someone who's... Like, when we had... A, we've just had a, a baby. We just had his, Wolfie's five months old now. And right before Wolfie showed up, Audrey, my wife, could see me losing it again. And she goes, I'm going to need you to get back on meds. I need you to get, you know, be here for this boy. So I had to get back on meds. And having Wolf in my life, I can promise you, with a baby in your life, that is hope. That is absolute hope. What can we build for this child? All right? And I would... Please, the world needs your child in it. Because you think about it. Please. I, I can see Jennifer wanting to get in here. I mean, I, 
I suspect over the Christmas period, this issue has been raised over family tables. Everyone's got an uncle that says, oh, this climate anxiety stuff's nonsense. What, what, Look, what I do think, you think it's real, but I think we've got a... Surely we've got a collective responsibility to actually chart a course that gives you the hope that you would have a kid. Um, the kind of... The, the point that people have been making, that in Australia particularly, we've got the technology, the wherewithal, the skills to actually be a global superpower in exporting renewables, in exporting hydrogen, in exporting lithium. This should be a good story for Australia if we get things right. And I think we've got an obligation, a responsibility, to actually take control of this issue and, and paint a positive story for people but, so we can get the community... it's not just about spinning a story, though, Of course it? it's not. So, so it's... why have we gotten to this point where young people are making a decision like well, that? Well, I think part of it is Martine's point that we're not telling the stories about what people are doing. But there's so, a, there's so... another issue to that. And I think, Hamish, I mean, one of the real issues is that in Australia and the US, climate is a toxic issue. In the rest of the world, we don't have this debate, right? The rest of the world is moving very fast. It's a completely different story and narrative. And I often talk to my kids about this, the same, I have 17-year-old twins, and my daughter Natalie and I were talking about the fact that, you know, why have we, the older generation, left such a bad situation for her? And it's the same thing, why would I want to have kids? But the point is that there is a phenomenal opportunity here, and we've got to look at... There is a, there is a fantastic range of, of, of new energies coming out. There's real innovations in agriculture. There's, you know, driving a Tesla is far better than driving a petrol car. I mean, there are fantastic things to do in, in society. And if we work together and we embrace that... And the one message I really want to give you is that what you hear in Australia is very different to the rest of the world. Correct. And, and the US. And I think here, we, unfortunately, the politics of climate change has been exactly. challenging, but in many other countries it's not. And again, when you look at the sort of stuff that ARENA funds and that we do, it is amazing. The technologies that are coming through the system... But, but this has got to be more than just telling a better story. I mean, I are you know, seriously saying to young people, we've just made some mistakes in the way we've told the story? No, no, no. no it's, not at all. It's, I think part of it is making sure people are aware of what's actually happening on the ground, that there are big innovations, that there are huge opportunities. Does this also mean acknowledging failure? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it... Ha and I think we've allowed this to become a very toxic debate in this country for a decade now. We've not been able to make progress. But it is also about getting the plan that Tony's talking about. You know, it is about making sure that we get the plan, we stick to the plan, we show people we're making progress on the plan and that we do that in a way that, that does create those opportunities that we've been talking about. But how about. can a young person have faith that an Australian government will do that, given what we've just all as a community well, well, witnessed for the last decade I think we've got to take a few steps so. here, Hamish. So, you know, my, my suggestion is that the first step we could take is to agree that net zero target. I mean, you know, frankly, if we could get to that, just agreeing that at the moment, there's step number one. It's step number two, and this is the work uh, someone asked me, uh, you know, that we're doing in the Business Council. Well, how do we get there? I'd say the, the first step number one would be like, um, Scott Morrison, it'll be OK if we... You can change your mind, we'll be all right with it. <laughs> all right? <laughs> on, on, on what? Um, you're, a, we're, you're allowed to say, I got it wrong. Um, here, let's do this instead. All right, let's just allow our politicians some room to move. Because if we go, aha, but you said something else eight years ago, they, they're so tied into this idea of catching each other out. Mm. They've painted themselves into a corner. And even though it's very clear we stand on the cusp of economic abundance in this situation, they're so terrified to move. But it's not just that. They've got people in their own party, this government... Yes. ..that want this government to spend money on building... New coal-fired power stations. And if those people were selling us mobile phones, they'd be going, no, 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 the Nokia 3210, that's going to be the only phone we're ever going to need. <laughs> All right? I'm telling you that, that we're, we are, as a country, exporting coal. We are, we are Nokia with a 3210 trying to think that everyone's going to only ever want to play Snake forever. Okay. And the iPhone is coming. We, we have a question about that uh, from Ray Burgess, who's come from the Latrobe Valley tonight. Uh, uh, and you, in a sense, describe your own anxiety about these issues from a very different perspective. I should note that you ran as an independent in the state election in Victoria in 2018, in part because you feel so strongly about this. Your question. Mm -hmm. I'm on quite dangerous territory here with this audience and uh, panel, I have to say. But um, I've uh, worked in the power industry for 15 years. Um, I've been uh, in business as the news agent in Mall for 27 years, been through the mine fire, been through a lot of the um, depressed economic uh, conditions that have... Um, been occurring in the valley. Um, 
But my, my point tonight is a key national asset in the minds of um, Latrobe Valley people and many Australians other than Latrobe Valley people um, is our brown coal assets. Now, uh, given that uh, 70 to 80 per cent of Victoria's electrical energy is generated by brown coal um, and the shortcomings of uh, intermittent wind and solar, sadly, uh, what role does the panel see for uh, what we consider our best asset, uh, brown coal, uh, in the years coming forward? Martin Wilder, let's have a really straight answer on this, please. Yeah, so the fact is that we're in a transition period and I think that coal, whether we like it or not, we're either going to have a chaotic disruption or a planned transition. And basically, no matter what we do, the owners of those coal mines and those coal-powered fire stations are getting out of those assets. They're old assets and they're looking at new assets. So if you want new generation in this country, the fact is the cheapest generation is wind and solar and so people are migrating in that direction. So we need to make it very clear that as those owners of those assets shut down those power stations, that there is a clear plan of transition. And I think, you know, we have to acknowledge the fact that the jobs that you have are critically important to this economy, that we can't leave you hanging out there and that we have to have that transition and make it work. I think the other point is also that, you know, there is... A, uh, there is a, a clear roadmap being developed around technology. There's a real focus on how you talked about the intermittency of wind and solar. You're absolutely right. It is more intermittent, but that's why there's a lot of work going on on things like batteries. Uh, there's more transition lines like a second bass link. There's a lot of work going on to try to stabilise the system. And people like AEMO are doing an incredible job in that. And, I mean, th th what I can say to you is that we just have to work better to make sure that that, that inevitable transition happens but over the longer term, there's going to be a lot more jobs created, a lot more opportunities, there's going to be a lower cost of energy, there's going to be reduced emissions, and there's going to be fantastic things in our economy. And we have the opportunity, as Alan Finkel talks about, building a hydrogen economy and actually bringing manufacturing back to this country rather than sending it overseas. And we also have the opportunity to send a lot of that hydrogen as well as other energy that we're producing overseas. And we can, as you said before, be a great export nation in renewable energy and we can have it and grow our economy on that. And we have to be positive about this <laughs> and in the process help you transition. It's, 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 not like, it's not like we're reinventing the wheel here. It's like a country like Germany managed to close every one of their coal mines and not one miner lost a job. Like, it can be done. All right, and the, the transition away from that absolutely has to happen, and, but it does require leadership. It requires a leader to stand up and say, you're important, this is how we're going to do it, here's the steps we're going to take. And as you mentioned, mm, yeah. I'm sure, like, like it or not, the world is going to stop buying our coal, all right? I'm sure we would prefer to dictate that timeline of how we transition away from it rather than be caught with our pants down when the price plummets. But isn't Japan no. building 22 new coal-fired power plants? No, it's not, and that is not correct. So Japan announced after Fukushima went down that they would build a series of new coal plants. However, over time, they've been trying to increase their, their energy security, have been building a massive amount of renewables. They've also said to the world, if you bring us hydrogen at the right price, right. we will switch to hydrogen, and we will be putting hydrogen in those plants, not coal. And so there's a massive opportunity for us. There's a massive market for us. Why aren't we need to build all that hydrogen? And to be fair, Alan Finkel and the federal government are focused on this now. That is a great market for us to, to sell that hydrogen into. And as more hydrogen goes in the system and more renewables, there will be less coal. And the same for India. Exactly the same issue. All right. Our next question tonight comes from James Barclay. I am passionate about climate change due to my young age of 18. And I do see the need to take action. However, I believe in an alternative method, and that's nuclear energy. Considering the harmful emissions of coal and the inconsistency of renewables, is it time for Australia to look at developing a new industry that will create thousands of jobs in nuclear, which provides zero emissions, is extremely reliable and would lower the cost of electricity? Martin, should that be in the mix? Um, so I don't believe that it will lower the cost of energy. Um, but I think the thing that you need to understand about nuclear is that obviously nuclear energy around the world it has played an important role. But for many of us know that we've had many disasters like Chernobyl, Fukushima. It, it, it is still presented with these challenges. It costs a lot of money to build. It takes a long time to build. It's a lot of money to decommission. And then you've got to deal with the nuclear waste issue. So at the end of the day, I guess one thing I would say to you is, will an investor invest in nuclear? And I think in this country, probably no. And in this country, it's politically, uh, a lot of the public don't, aren't fond of nuclear. I mean, the irony is, is that in, in Europe, very strong on nuclear, very anti-coal. Here, very strong on coal, quite anti-nuclear. 
I think, you know, there are other forms of nuclear energy, if we had more R&D, that over time may evolve. Mm. And I think with some of these disasters, one of the problems that's happened is a lot of the R&D into nuclear energy stalled for a while, so the cost did not come down. But whether it's nuclear fission or other aspects of nuclear energy that can evolve over time, that, that's still a possibility. So, you know... I'm going to have to disagree with you on a bunch of stuff there, mate. Sure. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a real shame... Uh, and I appreciate your question very much that I'm so grateful I get a chance to talk about this. It's a real shame they never made an eight-part miniseries about the hundreds and thousands of horrible aircraft accidents where entire plane loads of people died that created the safety requirements, the procedures and the devices which make airline travel the safest thing in the world. But they did make HBO Chernobyl. And it's, a real, it's an absolute fact that nuclear power is something like 470 times safer than coal. It's one of the safest things there is. And, like, when you talk about nuclear disasters, Three Mile Island, the people in Three Mile Island, they had, like, the equivalent of, like, a sixth of an X-ray exposure. All right? It's a real shame. And particularly... You did yes, mention... But, yes, but the point is it changed the political narrative. So it, it did. did. And it did that's a real things. shame. It's a real and, shame. And so in Japan, they said, right, nuclear's gone, we've got to do something else. But no-one got hurt from that. The people got hurt evacuating. They didn't get but, hurt but it, from, it, the, from the reactor. Yeah, They're still it's sucking it's... radioactive water out of uh, pumping or talking about pumping radioactive water out of Japan out of the nuclear reactor um, holding tanks into the ocean so so nothing got hurt I mean seriously and so when, when, you, when you've got nuclear waste what what is the plan and and, how, and what's the half I'll tell of you that, that um, nuclear when waste? you use uh, phase four nuclear power stations use spent nuclear fuel and they reduce the half-life down from a couple of thousand years to just a couple of hundred years and they made they have molten salt so if they yeah, break yeah. they free so they, so they, I, I want to get punting into West the next generation. Here because I can see that you've got something <laughs> no, no, I, I just think it's one of that. It's a really important question. I think I think we we've had far too much in this debate of just ruling things in and ruling things out. And as technology changes and as it improves, we should be open that if that technology improves and some of the issues that Matthew's talking about, you know, it can be solved. We should not be saying we'll never ever. You know, the number of times in Australia we'll never ever, and that has cost us dearly to actually make progress on this issue. So I think we should have an open mind about it. Jay Wetherill, when he was Premier of South Australia, took a Royal Commission, a very courageous decision for him politically, to try and see how we would map our way to whether or not we could actually uh, create a nuclear industry. And I, I think we should be really open to it. If, Martine, we are moving towards a net zero emissions yep. economy by 2050, yep. what does the energy mix actually look like? These people want yep. some ideas about what Australia will be like by that time. Can you paint a simple picture? Yeah. So, AEMO, have, the energy market regulator, has come out with the integrated um, plan um, last year and they've basically said, as business as usual, our energy mix will be 75% renewables with a lot of uh, pumped hydro storage in that mix, a very small amount of gas, and the rest will be the, 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 what is in the system currently phasing out. That's if we do nothing over the next 20 years. That is, as a, that's the biggest integrated system plan study ever in this country of our energy system. That is what they're telling us it will be the mix. If we do more policy interventions and we spend a little bit more money, then that will actually lead to up to, I think it's 94% renewables in the mix. Um, again, with a lot of pumped hydro in there and a lot of storage in there. Um, and in addition to that, we will also have a huge amount of energy in regional areas and a huge amount of jobs. So our own sort of, sort of AEMO itself is making those, those, those statements through that. And again, the federal government is about to release, I think soon in the next few months, an energy technology plan that backs into that. And we've got a huge amount of investment going on. Yeah. So at the end of the day, investment will go where the best opportunities and returns are. And at the moment, the truth of the matter is, for new build, that's in solar batteries. And also this really interesting technologies that are coming out, like software to actually manage demand and supply on the grid. Um, and look, in the next 10 years, there will be things that will generate energy that we haven't even thought of today. All right. Our next question tonight comes from Kate Myrams. Thanks, Hamish, and thanks for inviting me to be here today. Um, I'm a dairy farmer from uh, Gippsland, just east of the Latrobe Valley, where lots of our other guests are from. And for the last 20 years, we have worked very hard on looking after the environment, doing a lot of things, planting trees, planting, uh, fencing off waterways, um, putting in solar power on our dairy. We've done, as you know, just everything that has been suggested to improve the environment, to look after the Gippsland lakes and look after our waterways. But it's not enough. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are still going up. And I think this is the climate anxiety that's been discussed tonight is we are um, feeling 
collectively that all the little things we do, op shopping and all the little composting things, they're not enough. My question tonight is that we are ready and willing to sequester bulk amounts of carbon into agricultural soil in this land. But where are the practices, the plant species, the soil conditions? Where's the research that tells us how to do it effectively and quickly across this nation? How do farmers like us get access to that information as well? Matthew. Yeah, great question. Um, so to just frame it for the general public, the, between a quarter and a third of the increase in carbon in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution, since we started burning coal um, 200 plus years ago, uh, between a quarter and a third of the increase in atmospheric carbon has come from soil. The biggest releaser of carbon into the atmosphere until the 1960s was the plough, because we have removed carbon from soil. Today, even today, having lost carbon from soil, the top one metre of the earth stores three times more carbon than the atmosphere, right? The, the, the importance of soil cannot be overstated in, in, the, in the climate change debate. And what we have done, and it's, no one's done this on purpose. Farmers haven't done this on purpose. We ploughed because we got better yields, but then we've discovered that after 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 years, we, our yields would drop. But what, we would, what we've done, as we've, and, and this is where this debate gets really yeah, polarised, it's like, it's like all good and bad, you know, angels and devils, you know, there's no absolutes. Um, but, but, the, but we've made lots of bad decisions in terms of farming and how we do it. But we now know, we have the science to be able to store carbon in soil again. Instead of releasing it into the atmosphere like we've done for the last 250 years, we have the capacity to store carbon in soil. We have the technology, we have the tools, and it's only recently we've had the way to measure it. And what, what, what farming and agriculture can do is w store way more carbon um, uh, than, than, than is... But, you know, if, you, if we can take 0.4%, uh, uh, you know, all agri agricultural land... The French government have this policy. Uh, uh, if you can take um, uh, all of the agricultural land and increase the soil carbon by 0.4%, right, it's not huge, it's a, it's a relatively small amount. A, a farmer in, in Gippsland... Uh, managed to increase his soil carbon 7% in five years. So 0.4%, if we can increase it 0.4%, that negates all the carbon emissions in the world in, from, from fossil fuels. But you also have to understand agriculture is, is different to fossil fuel use in lots of ways. And your cows are different to... to, to you know, people demonise the cow, and the question about meat before was really an interesting one. When, when it, all energy on earth comes from can, the sun. Can we just stick to solutions? <laughs> I, I know you're passionate can about soil, but I, yeah, I, just I just want to get Sophia in here because yeah. you are working on yeah. this very science that that question so is about. Yeah. We absolutely need a portfolio of solutions to address the problem, and we need solutions in soil carbon, and we need to plant way more trees, and we need to be storing um, CO2 into lots of different things. But at the end of the day, um, it takes 20 years for technological solutions to go from idea to market. And we need way more government support to help these um, technologies get there. The other point that I wanted to make is about soil carbon is absolutely great, but we, there, um, the amount of time that the soil is, the carbon is stored is, I think it's less than 100 years. And for a tree, when you plant a tree, um, and the tree grows, it stores carbon in, into its um, trunk and its uh, leaves, and then when that tree burns or rots, it releases all of the CO2 that it has ever sequestered. So we need a range, a portfolio of solutions to, um, to address this problem because we can't put all of our eggs in any one basket. And in terms of scaling up the sorts of things you're working on, yep. are we anywhere near where we need to be in order to start meeting the targets that we're talking about? Our technological solution actually is incredibly scalable. So mineral carbonation can um, lock away millions or billions of tonnes of CO2 uh, is actually scalable to the source of the problem. Um, but it, as I said... But you want to suck it out of the atmosphere. Yeah, so we, we can partner with, uh, with technologies that suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. But right now we partner with heavy industries like steel and cement. Because even after we're at 100% renewable energy and we, we've got hydrogen and we've got everything, we still will have emitting industries. Um, cement and steel are a, a big issue. So and we will overshoot our carbon budget and we will be needing to suck CO2 out of our atmosphere in order for us to avert, um, not have catastrophic... But we've got, I need to take one more question with us. That's all we've got time for. David McLean. 
Um, my question, I guess, is about leadership. We've been talking about the imperative for change across a whole range of sectors, industry, energy, agriculture, uh, land management. Um, there's a massive imperative for change. There's a lot of opportunity there. The question about leadership is how do we go about creating this national vision for all these diverse things where leadership's already emerging? How do we create that vision? How do we create a national consensus? Is there a role for national leadership? Where's it going to come from? What's it going to look Sophia. like? I think we have the opportunity in Australia to have our man on the moon moment and Zali is a, a part of that but when America said they'd put on a man, a man on the moon in eight years time they didn't have the technological um, capability yet they didn't know how they were going to do it but they set forward a vision and a, a leadership plan and industry aligned behind them this is the time that Australia can do that 2050 is probably too far. We can make it sooner, 2040. We can achieve negative emissions. We, we need to be ambitious and this is the time that we can do it. Jennifer Westacott. Is that the kind of national leadership you want well, to see? It is the kind of national leadership and you do have to start somewhere which is where I go back to my original point. We've got to set that vision for where we want to be because and then we've got to I think really map that out for people. Because Are you and business willing to stand up yeah, we be, already and have. And I mean, lead we, us we, through this, this has been our policy for a long time, the net zero uh, target. That's, that's, that's always been the BCA's policy and to accept the science of climate change. So, but, I, but I do think it goes beyond that, though. You've got to step out the how. The how really matters. It matters to Tony. Uh, it matters for jobs. It matters for regions. And we've got a responsibility to step out how that will actually occur. Because just saying stuff and then not being able to show how we're going to do it over what period of time, at what cost, with what technology, with what policy settings, with what incentives. That will be another set of empty words that Australians will become very, very cynical about. So we've got it. I think Sophie is absolutely right. That's the kind of light on the hill, if you will, that we've got to head to. But I think what people in Australia want to see is the detailed plan. And that's what business particularly has to lead. And that's the work that we've announced today. Uh, to show people that we can do this, to show them we can do this in a way that's going to create new jobs, better jobs, turn us into this incredible energy superpower. But I, I can't underestimate the importance of the how and the detail. This has always, as Martine, I'm sure, would agree with me, this has always got stuck on the detail. It's always got stuck on the ideology. It's always got stuck on the demons and angels. We've got to move past this point right now. All right. So we've got the well, farmers want it. The people want it, the businesses want it, you know. Pretty much everyone wants it. It's just that tiny little sprinkling of politicians, who, who uh, federal politicians, not state, who seem to be in the way of, of good, good policy and decision making. Well, on that note, that's all we have time for tonight. Live music in a moment. Uh, but you, can you please thank our panel? Sophia Hamlin Wang, Matt Evans, Jennifer Westacott, Osher Ginsberg, and Martine Wilder. Please put your hands together. <laughs> Well, next week, we're talking about trust. And the politicians are promising to leave the talking points behind. Seriously, they promised us they'll do that. But now to take us out with his new track called Sleep Australia Sleep, he's an Aussie icon joined by Alice Keith and Simon Nugent. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Paul Kelly. Australia sleep, the night is on the creek. Shut out the noise all around. Sleep Australia sleep, and dream of counting sheep. Jump in in fields coloured brown. Who rock the cradle and cry? Who rock the cradle? Sleep Australia sleep As off the cliff the kingdoms leap Count them as they say goodbye Count down the little things The insects and birds Count down the bigger things The flocks and the herds Count down our rivers Our pastures and trees but there's no need to hurry All oh, sleep now, don't worry Cause it's only a matter of degrees 
frog is straight your frog Just like the boiling frog As we go we won't feel a thing Keep mounting, but hey, that's just the way this old world goes. Sleep, my country, sleep. As we sow, so shall we reap. Who rock the cradle and cry? 